Some of our readers may not be familiar with you, so if you would, please introduce yourself. Ah, well, um, the semi-detailed version you can find on my website, TomCrappen.com. Um, mostly I'm a soldier. Uh, I've, I've done different things, uh, but I served in the Army from 74 to 78, 90 to 92, at which point the bottom completely dropped out of the militantly and violently aggressive anti-communism market. Uh, so I went to law school. Um, then in I served 97, and then uh, beginning of 03 to the beginning of 06. Uh, somewhere in the interim, I practiced. I went to law school. I practiced law for about eight years. Hated it. Like you wouldn't believe. Um, in, in fact, let me let me interject there that unlike most people, I watched the trap door under Saddam Hussein open up with very mixed feelings because you see he had come through for me twice. He got me out of recruiting command in 1990, and he got me out of practicing law in 2003. I owed him. All right. Oh, oh and now I write for Bane. Yeah. See? He even has my name on it. Growing up, how much military fiction or science fiction did you read? Uh, not a lot of military fiction. Um, some military science fiction. Um, an awful lot of military history. Uh, this kind of odd little story there. Um, my mother, my grandmother, and my aunts taught me to read when I was about two and a half. So when I was about two and a half, my mother marched me down to the library in South Boston, Massachusetts, to get some books and my very first library card. Well, the books I picked out were all military history. Uh, one in particular sticks in my mind was the Battle of Midway, author I don't remember. Librarian said, no, you can't have those. You're only two and a half. My mother said, he can read them. No, he can't. Yes, he can. So she had me read the Battle of Midway um, to her, aloud, uh, several pages of it. And so I was the only two and a half year old, year old with an adult library card in South Boston, Massachusetts. Anyway, that's just a digression. Um, a lot of military history, um, starting as, you know, at, at two and a half and continuing to the present day. Not a lot of science fiction. I don't think I got into science fiction until I was probably about 11 or 12. Um, and at that time frame, there, there wasn't a lot of military science fiction being published. Uh, it tended to be somewhat utopian. I mean, iRobot was about as dark as it got. Um, I think... I think the first military science fiction book I read was um, Star Watchmen by Ben Bova. Um, I don't think it had any real influence on, on my going in the military. I was going to do that anyway. Um, it may have influenced how I acted in the military a bit here and there. When did you know you were going into the military? Two and a half. Um, when I was little, uh, my grandmother and my mother and my aunts, my cute little girl cousins, would sit around the table singing Irish Soldier Boy, which is about premature, glorious, and violent death for a cause. It does strange things to a young boy's mind, sends him to ranger school, things like that. So, uh, yeah, I always knew I was going in the Army. Or in the service. I wasn't sure about which service until, really, until I walked in the, into the recruiter's office. You mentioned Ben Bova. Which authors were your favorites? Uh, oddly enough, I didn't, well, there weren't that many people writing military science fiction then, remember. Uh, ben Bova, Heinlein, sort of, um, but he was still in his juvenile phase. Uh, I think the, and I've read, read some of it um, fairly young. I don't think I found Starship Troopers until I was 14 or so, 10 or 11 years after it came out. And of course, I fell in love with history and moral philosophy and the, the entire political system there. And I have yet to find a soldier who doesn't approve. Um, uh, any others particularly strike you at that time? At that time, not that I remember. Um, Out of curiosity, uh, which... Turn that chair around so you can sit. <laughs> ah. <laughs> You mentioned histories, or what were some of the particular histories or particular authors of histories that you enjoyed reading? Back then? Yes. 
William Schrar, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Collapse of the Third Republic, um, Poland, um, God, I read a lot, <laughs> that really stick in my mind, probably those, at least I've still got their books, um, I can't say that for some of the others that I read. That is the ultimate test, I guess. Who are the authors you still have after all that time? Oh, no. The reason I, I've lost a lot of authors is my basement flooded. <laughs> and I lost. My wife say I was off at the war. Not at the war, at the war college. Uh, and the wife saved most of my books. But there were at least a thousand or so that just turned into waterlogged masses of pulp and uh, had to be thrown out. Yeah, it's, it sucks. Um, your Army career covered a fair bit of ground and moved around a bit uh, from the Rangers on. Just the school, not the scroll. It shows in your books, but you know a little bit about training. Oh, I'm a fanatic. Absolutely. No, I'm not going to say anything in modest. Yeah, I am. I was really good at it. <laughs> uh, and there were reasons for that. Besides um, personal inclination, I was also lucky as hell in my assignments. Uh, my first was the 101st, which uh, at the time, 75 and 76, they closed the division down in Vietnam. They didn't return it. They shut it down, distributed, I think, whatever troops were left, moved the colors back, and then rebuilt it. So they didn't really know. I mean, it was badly organized. They didn't know what to do. Um, we were very physically fit um, because that's most of what we did was PT. We went to the field. It was a lot of marching around in the mud. Not a lot of purpose. Not, not a, a good feel for training. Uh, from there, I went to the 193rd. After two years, I went to the 193rd in Panama. By the way, we've got an airport right over there. 193rd in Panama, which had never been shut down and had never been basically destroyed in the same way the rest of the army had been destroyed as a result of uh, not losing Vietnam, uh, but disengaging from it and the way we disengaged from it. The 193rd was really good, really did know how to train. Um, and the contrast between the two uh, sort of set me uh, on what is right to do um, in the army. I was also fortunate uh, in particular with a, uh, my platoon leader was a West Pointer named Mike Smith, uh, who to my deep disappointment now works for the State Department. Um, but he was a superb, uh, probably the best lieutenant I ever um, worked for, with, or had worked for me. Best lieutenant I ever saw. Better than I was anyway. Do you feel that service is a prerequisite for writing good military fiction or science fiction? No, with caveats. Um, you cannot have service and write military fiction or science fiction and stay away from anything that you don't know and to understand that you know nothing. It's really hard to do. Or you can read a great deal. Um, there's at least one science fiction author, John Scalzi, who has um, two or three military sci-fi books out. He's done pretty well. Um, I understand he doesn't have a day in uniform, but he didn't screw it up. Some people don't like it, don't like his books. I do, personally. Um, he, he stayed away from what he didn't know, concentrated on, on what he could know, and concentrated on the soldiers as people, because they really began as just regular people before they became soldiers, and never stopped being regular people in, in bad circumstances. Uh, so it, it's certainly possible to do. Uh, Eric Flint doesn't have a day in uniform. And his Belisarius series is pretty good military alternate history. Um, but 
Eric's A, really bright. Um, B, reads a great deal. C, knows what he doesn't know. Um, and D, has David Drake checking behind him. Um, and David, of course, has served. And although he denies it, I've been to David's house, and it's military from top to bottom in subtle little ways. Yes, David, if you see this, it's true. You may not admit it, but you're eat up with it.